All right, good morning, everybody. Good to see you guys. We're glad that you are all here. Now listen, when I was in second grade, I had a Ninevite as a teacher. Her name was Mrs. Wittenberg, and she was evil, just like the Ninevites were. She was old, just like the Ninevites were. (laughs) She probably should have stopped teaching a long time ago. And it was horrific. So I figured out a way to get around this. This was a problem in my life. And so I was like, okay, so I need to not be in this class as much as possible. So I was a little second grader figuring this out. Uh, I decided that I would go over to the nurse's station, which was directly across the hall. Her name was Mrs. Moriarty. Now, Mrs. Moriarty was younger, far more attractive, and so as a second grader, I, th- I think I might have had a, l- a little bit of a crush on Mrs. Moriarty. And, uh, but it was, it was amazing because I would go over there and, and I kept telling her that, like, I don't think I can see clearly. Like, because you can only go in with a headache for so many days, right? But seeing, they'll give you the eye exam all the time. So I would go over there, I would fail the eye exam over and over and over again just to get out of, out of Mrs. Wittenberg's uh, second grade class. It was a horrible, horrible thing. But you know what? I also was a second grader, and I had like big aspirations, big visions. I didn't really understand that the misses meant that she was off the market. I didn't see a ring. You know what that means? No ring, no thing. So I'm like, okay, we can see what we can do here. Um, and so it didn't. It didn't happen, unfortunately. But the joke was on me because two years later, I would actually fail an eye exam for real this time, and then they would strap me up with glasses for the rest of my life. Had I known that, I would have tried to like avoid that with everything I could. Because let me tell you what defined my middle school experience. Rex Specs. Anybody remember Rex Specs? <laughs> yeah, that's right. This is me in middle school. Imagine going through sixth grade with these bad boys on, right? You're out on the soccer field. You're like trying to chase down the ball. And you're like, hey, pass it to me. Pass it over here. Uh, that whole thing, like nobody's having it. Nobody's, you're not the cool guy on the team. You're the guy that's got Rex Specs on, okay? Tough. That is tough. Uh, it then, but it wasn't until college... It was in college that I figured out that I could actually use glasses to my advantage, right? Like, this is is positive. Glasses became that thing that was helpful for me. Because everybody knows that a man with glasses and no hair, bald men and glasses, are far more handsome and smarter, more intelligent than anybody else, right? Like, I've actually moved to calling these intelligence enhancers, okay? Because... People are marketing it this way. Look at this. This is Glasses Direct. You can buy glasses there. They say this, look smart, buy smarter. They know that if you put glasses on your face, you're gonna, people are going to perceive you as being smarter. This guy's probably really only like a C-grade student, but throw some glasses on his face, solid B, solid at least. Like he's, he's rocking that B. Um, but the reality is today, some of you in this space, you have to wear glasses just like me. Um, you have your glasses on now because without glasses, you wouldn't see clearly. It just wouldn't happen. And, uh, you know, the other day I got a, an email notification from LensCrafters. It's time for me to come in for my, my yearly eye exam, right? They sit you down in some strange chair and put a contraption in front of your face and then they make you stare at a screen like this and they say read the smallest print you possibly can well anybody in this room is going to fail that like come on we're all on the same page together we're going to fail that but they they do that over and over and over again but this email from lens crafters came at a perfect time because it was like two weeks ago i'm laying in bed i had this feeling like kind of this i woke up in the morning and i had this panic feeling because i couldn't see anything like Everything was blurry, and it was like dark, and I was like, what's going on? Like, it wasn't until I realized I had the sheet over my head that I was like, come on, that's a terrible joke. Don't laugh at that stuff. Like, you're just going to encourage me. Like, next week I'll come back with something worse. But so, some of you know exactly what I mean. When I talk about seeing, when I talk about vision, you get it. Like, you're the ones that you fumble in the morning for your glasses, without your contacts, without that LASIK surgery. Who knows where you would be, right? Like, we understand that. See, vision, correct vision, helps you see what's clearly in front of you, clearly, right? And But without your glasses, you have no idea what's going to happen because vision is critical. One thing that we all can agree on in this room, every person, no matter what, you would agree that vision is critical. It's critical. It affects the way that you go through the rest of your day. And in fact, it affects, I think, the way that you go through your life. If you and I, if we're not careful, without good vision, we can cause damage to ourselves and damage to other people. 
Like, for example, on my license, right now, on my license, and some of this is on yours too, there's a little spot right here that says restrictions. And I have a, a class A restriction on my license, which means that in order to drive my car legally, I have to wear corrective lenses. Because the state of Florida, in fact, everywhere, they recognize that without corrective lenses, my vision, the lack of vision that I have physically could be dangerous to you, could be dangerous to others, and quite honestly, could even be dangerous to myself. And so they put that there because I have to wear these in order to legally drive my car. Vision. Vision is critical. Vision affects every aspect of your life. And Jonah, we're in the midst of a series called Big Fish where we've been taking a look at the book of Jonah. This man, Jonah, a prophet of God, struggled with vision. He had a vision problem. And I want to take a look at that with you this morning. So here's, here's just in recap. Today we're going to look back. Jonah chapter 1, we see the very first example of Jonah's vision problem. God said to Jonah, go to Nineveh to preach against it. But Jonah headed to Tarshish. He just headed in the opposite direction. Why? Because God, God said to Jonah, go to Nineveh, and Jonah could not see. Why why would God want me to go to Nineveh? He couldn't see why that would be a possibility or why he should do that. And he made the decision based upon what he saw to do this. Instead, he went to Tarshish. He headed 3,000 miles in the opposite direction. But somewhere along the way, God threw a storm on the water and that boat was rocking and rolling and the, the sailors came to Jonah. They're like, what did you do? What do we do? Jonah said, throw me overboard. So they threw him overboard and God provided a great fish to swallow Jonah up. And he swallowed him and he was in there for three days and three nights before this fish vomited Jonah back up onto a beach. See, we were reminded that the very thing that you thought could kill you, God will sometimes use to save you. But look at what God said to Jonah after he's been pruny and he's sitting on the beach, right? After this second chance, God says to Jonah again, go to the great city of Nineveh and I want you to proclaim the message I give to you. Jonah obeyed this time, and he went to Nineveh. See, it was because of Jonah's obedience that an entire city's life was changed. The, the course of, of two generations, a hundred years, the, the city of Nineveh was changed. And it says this in verse 10 of chapter 3. When God saw what they did, when they, God saw what Nineveh did, and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented. And he did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. So all that he had threatened, God did not bring that on Nineveh. Why? Because Jonah obeyed God. Because Jonah obeyed and he went to Nineveh. And yet, today we find Jonah kind of in this confused, perplexed position. Right? He's sitting there and he's trying to figure out, like, how do I feel about this? See, chapter 4 is all about this. See, at first glance, you and I would think that Jonah should be like, he should be high as a kite. This guy should be like, yeah, I did it. Like my, In my second chance, I actually listened to God, and, and things happened because of what I did. Things happened because I followed through on what God asked me to do. I was a prophet, and I proclaimed the message, and all those people turned and repented and came back to God. But that's not how Jonah saw it. Jonah didn't see it this way. In fact, today we're going to conclude this series with the fourth chapter of Jonah, which is found on page 646 on the Bibles around you. You can turn there or click over in your version app. See, Jonah chapter 4, Jonah has this weird, strange response to the nation of Assyria, to the city of Nineveh. And look at, look at what it says in Jonah chapter 4, verse 1. It says, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became, say this word right here, he became what? Angry. Jonah became angry because of the response of Nineveh. And he prayed to the Lord. He said, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? Like, isn't this what I said? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. Like, I actually tried to hit pause on this whole, this whole like, Nineveh coming back to God thing. Because why? I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God. I knew that you're slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, oh, Lord, take away my life. 
for it's better for me to die than it is to live. This is what Jonah's saying, right? Like he gets to the end of his rope and he's like, God, I can't believe what's happening in front of me. Like this is ridiculous. Jonah was furious with the outcome of Nineveh. Do you see what Jonah said there? He said, it's actually a part of the reason why I didn't go to, to Nineveh in the first place is because I was scared. Not scared for my life. Not scared that Ninevites are going to hurt me or, or maim me or kill me. He was scared that Nineveh might actually repent and go back to God. He was scared that Nineveh might not be punished. That's why he didn't want to go. And so when it all didn't happen, when they weren't punished, when their city wasn't torched with fire, or when there wasn't like, you know, people being wiped off the face of the earth, Jonah became angry. He started kind of pounding his fist and shaking his fist in the air like, what gives? See, in fact, in Jonah, we see him slipping and stepping into a major depression. Some of the signs of depression are, are when you, you feel like the situation is so bad, that everything around you is so rough, that it might just be easier if I wasn't here. And that's exactly where we find him. We find this depressed prophet, this depressed prophet who, who should, in fact, be overwhelmed with what had just happened. Have you guys ever had that feeling of frustration when somebody doesn't get what you think they deserve, right? Like maybe you, you have this coworker at work right now. You're probably thinking of the guy already. You're like, oh man, I know exactly who that is. The guy shows up late, inevitably like 15, 20 minutes every day. You know, you're supposed to be there at 9. He strolls in at 9.15, 9.20. He's got his grande cup of something Starbucks in his hand and, and like a double smoked bacon sandwich. And meanwhile, you had to run out of the house. You've got coffee stains on your shirt because you're on the way to work and you're just trying to get some coffee in. You didn't eat breakfast, but that guy takes his grand old time, stops, gets everything he needs, makes sure he's comfortable, walks into work late all the time, and you're like, he never gets written up. He never gets docked his pay. What gives? Until that one day. Until that day when the boss says, I need to see you in the office. And you're like, yes, today's the day. Today's the day he gets what's coming to him. And he goes in there, sits down with the boss, and you kind of see the, the curtain gets pulled, the shades come down, and you're like, ooh, it's going to be a good one. Five minutes go by, and you're already starting to think, like, man, maybe I should go get some boxes ready for him, right? Like, you know, 15 minutes go by, and you're already, like, pulling his desk drawers out, packing it for him. 30 minutes go by, and you're like, that dude, like, here's some tissues. We need to be waiting for this guy. He's going to be crying when he comes out. 45 minutes goes by. Your boss walks out, and he says, uh, ladies and gentlemen, can I just get your attention real quick? I want to introduce you to your new manager. And you're like, what? Why do what gives here? Come on, this isn't right. Don't you know? He's always late. He's always drinking, always eating. The blah. This is, how can this be? And this is exactly where Jonah finds himself. He's like, what gives, God? Like, ugh, this is Nineveh we're talking about. They're evil. They're wicked. How could this be? But God comes back and asks Jonah one question. When he says, how could this be? God says this, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? Almost like, Jonah, why are you angry? Like, what gives? See, we, we see here that Jonah had gone out. Actually, it goes on and says he sat down at a place east of the city and there he made himself a shelter. He sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. That's strange. Because the city just repented. The city just came back to God. And here we find Jonah kind of setting up shop because he wants to wait and see what's going to happen to the city. It's almost as if he's saying like, God, there's still a chance. God, you could still wipe them out. God, send down that, like, that cool like fire and brimstone stuff. Like, make it happen. Like, make it rain. Jesus, come on. What's going on? And he's sitting there watching, watching and waiting with bated breath that the city might still be punished. And yet, according to his perspective, nothing happened. Nothing had happened. Like, what gives, God? He sees the evil, the wicked, the ruthless people missing out on the destruction that they were due. 
See, I'm convinced that Jonah was blind to the fact that what he actually was witnessing was God himself, (laughs) his grace was on display. God's grace was on display for everybody to see. See, this brings us to our, our big idea today, and that's that every way of seeing is a way of not seeing. I want you to write that down. Every way of seeing is a way of not seeing. For example, let me explain it to you this way. See, right now, you guys are all looking forward. There's a few of you sleeping. It's okay. But you're all looking forward at me. And what you don't see is you don't see that Gavin's in the back. Gavin is working hard to make sure that these slides transition at the right time in the message. And what you don't see is that the air conditioning uh, has recently kicked on. And that curtain in the back kind of pushes out a little bit when the, when the air kicks on. You don't see that every now and then there's somebody that will peek in through that door back there to see what's going on here. You don't see all of that. Because you're facing forward. You're looking at me. Every way of seeing is a way of not seeing. For example, in the same thing, like I have no idea what's going on behind me. If I were to say, if you were to say to me, how many symbols are on that drum set? I don't know. I have to actually change the way that I see in order to figure that out. If you were to say, is there somebody behind you? I don't know. There could be. Because I cannot see that. Every way of seeing is a way of not seeing. And see, I'm convinced that the way that you see affects what you see. And what you see is so critical. Because what you see, we call that your perspective. Your perspective in life is crucial. And think about Jonah. Jonah was stuck in one perspective. He was stuck seeing things one way. And that perspective was his own. He could only see things from his point of view. He couldn't see things from any any other perspective And what did it do? But it blinded him to seeing every other way. Every other way. See, the reality on perspective is that it can also clear up your sight. It can help you see clearly. This is my family. My wife, Tiffany, you saw her earlier, and my son, Noah, and my daughter, Grace, and Leah. Um, hopefully, you guys had your, your Mother's Day picture taken last week. They're, if, if you did, they're on Facebook right now. You can go tag yourself, download it, print it, whatever. So this was us last week at, on Mother's Day, and several years ago, actually several years ago now, it's, it's crazy to think about this, we, uh, we were having a, an issue with one of our kids. One of our kids was struggling with authority. Str- particularly with um, our authority as parents in their life. Like I promise you all the time, we're normal parents. We're normal family. <laughs> Some of you out there are like, yeah, I'm right there with you. And so we were struggling with that. And it wasn't until I kind of sat the kid down and was like, like, what actually is, like, what's going on in your head right now? Like, why are you having a hard time when we ask you to brush your teeth or when we ask you to kind of clean up dishes or, or whatever, it, whatever it was? Why is this such a problem? And it came back where it was like, well, all you do is boss us around. All you do is this, that, and the other thing. You guys are this um, kind of authority figure. And, and so I was like, okay, wait, 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 wait. You, we need to understand this very clearly. We have to start seeing things from different perspectives. And it was when I was able to explain it that it flipped the perspective so that they weren't just seeing it from their eyes, but they were able to see it a little bit more from my perspective, my, my vision, things got better. Not perfect, <laughs> but better. Things got better. See, perspective can bring clarity. And there are some times in our life when, like my kids, we actually just need to flip our perspective so that you and I can see clearer. See, Jonah was blinded by his perspective. And remember that every way of seeing is a way of not seeing. He was blinded to everything that had happened around him. See, from his perspective, he would say, nothing happened. These people are still living, still breathing. What gives? Nothing has happened. But Jonah was actually sitting on the hillside, on the east side of the city, and he was witnessing God's grace on display. By nothing happening, he was witnessing some, something incredible happening. He was actually missing out on the picture of what God was doing in the lives of others. But why? Because he couldn't see it. His eyes he was stuck in his own perspective. Guys, listen to me. When your vision is affected, our actions are affected as well. When your vision, when you can't see clearly, your actions follow suit. 
See, you should see me in the middle of the night. When I lose these glasses and I, and I wake up in the middle of the night, um, I get up a little bit, like a little slower, a little more cautiously, and I kind of put my hands out in front of me, and I shuffle my feet because, like an old man, I just, like, I just don't want to trip on anything. And so I, you never know what's on the ground. You n- have no idea. How many of you have stepped on a Lego in the middle of the night, right? Like, you can lose Jesus in that moment. Like, he just up and leaves the room because it's like, wow! Who did that? And then you find that one Lego. In my house, the rule of thumb is if I step on that Lego, it's going in the garbage. I don't care how cool that piece is or how unique it, done. Because that is just like, it boils up rage inside of you. When you can't see things, when you cannot see clearly, your actions are affected. Whether that's stepping on a Lego, stubbing your toe, or something far worse than that. When you cannot see clearly, you behave differently. Let me show you what, what happens when we see with our own eyes and our own perspective. So there's a formula on the back of your notes. I want you to, to write this down as well. When we see with our eyes, when we look with our eyes, and we use our own perspective, inevitably, you and I will always land in a position where we act judgmental. This leads us to be judgmental. Our behavior is judgmental. See, we can't see it any other way. We just can't see anything else. All we start to do is we start looking at our life and comparing your life to ours. And so we start saying, well, I'm a little bit better than that person, clearly better looking than that guy, or I'm stronger, or I have more money, or we've got this, I've got that, and I can do this better. And all we do is we start to see people stacked up against us. And all we do is become judgmental and, quite honestly, just nasty people. However, What if we were to flip the perspective and we were to say, use our eyes and God's perspective? What could happen? See, I believe that God gave you your eyes. He gave you your vision to see the world around you. He wants you to use your eyes. However, he's invited us to use his perspective, to look at the world around us through God's perspective. And every time, when you do that appropriately, when you do that consistently, you and I, we will become people that respond graciously. We will lead out with grace. And in fact, we may look through our eyes and God's perspective and we will choose to see things graciously. We'll be more gracious in our interactions, more understanding of others. Because guys, grace, let me define it for you. You can write this down. Grace is God's unmerited favor. You did nothing to deserve it. There is nothing that you did that caused God to be gracious to you. There's just nothing about it, right? It's like when a police officer pulls you over for doing 45 and a 30. He comes up and he's like, uh, do you know why I pulled you over? And you're like, uh, maybe, I don't know. Like, and then he comes back to the window and he's like, ah, he's got paper. Ah, here, I'm done. And he actually hands you a warning. I've written you a warning. You did nothing to deserve that. Nothing. And still, he was, he was gracious towards you. Or it's like when your boss is gracious and he doesn't write you up or fire you for the fourth time that you're late, or the fourth time that you've you know, done something against company policy. Grace is seen when, when, you are <laughs> when you're snarky with a spouse. You've said something you didn't mean. And that spouse, instead of kind of hurling things back at you, just says nothing. But catch this. But then chooses not to hold it against you. That's Grace. That's when grace shows up. It's something that you did nothing to, to deserve it. In fact, you probably deserve some other kind of treatment, and yet that person is showing you grace. See, I believe that grace is life-changing. It's one of the most life-changing things that you and I can experience, but very often it requires God's perspective to apply. But another thing about grace is grace reveals God's character. Grace shows us what God is really like. I've experienced grace in my life time and time again. <laughs> Just talk to my mom. She could give you a list of things that she's shown me grace in. Talk to Tiffany. Spend 10 minutes with Tiffany and she would tell you, he's not all that he's cracked up to be, right? But Jonah just couldn't get it. Jonah couldn't see grace. And so to help Jonah understand the grace that was shown to Nineveh, God did something um, pretty incredible. Look with me in uh, chapter 4, verse 5. 
It says that Jonah had gone out and he sat down in a place east of the city. We already know this. He sat there, he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. Now, this is where God steps in. Then the Lord provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah. Maybe it's like a fiddle leaf fig, you know, make Joanna Gaines all happy, who knows. Um, to, give, to give shade for his head, to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind. And the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. And he wanted to die. And what did he say? He says, it would be better for me to die than to live. Here's this, this whole theme again. See, God provided all of this to help show Jonah what grace is about. You may be tempted to read this and think, oh, this is God showing Jonah grace. Mm -mm. This is God helping Jonah understand grace. See, Jonah's perspective on grace needed to be flipped. It needed to be changed. He needed to see clearer. And Jonah, according to his own perspective, could only see the world judgmentally. He judged the plant. He was angry about the plant. How dare that plant die? How dare that plant? And again, God comes back to him, trying to adjust his perspective. He says this, But God said to Jonah, Is it right? Is it right for you to be angry about this plant? To which Jonah's like, It is! It is right! And I'm so angry, I wish I was dead. Have you ever felt so angry with somebody else? So angry with your current situation that you actually thought, if, it ju- if it's going to be like this, if it's, this is just the way that it is, it may actually be better for me not to, not be, to be alive. It may not be worth living in this moment. That's how I felt. 1993, 94, 96. That was when the Cowboys won the Super Bowl, right? Like, this just isn't even worth it, right? Like, give it up. Come on. Troy Aikman, I'm sure God loves him. I do not. Right? Like, I do not have that, that feeling towards good old Troy. But seriously, in this, in this moment, some of you woke up today and you're like, if it's going to be like this, I don't know. I don't know if it's worth it. Maybe an ex has hurt you so deeply so, and it's left you so angry. Or maybe you've gone through a disappointment in life right now that's so deep so painful that it's actually hard to talk about it out loud. You can't even say the words. Or maybe the world has just kind of stopped because life has been so tough. You've heard something that has caused you some of the deepest concern in your life. And everything stops in that moment. And the world begins to spin only around you. And you begin to feel like it's all about you. And see, when you and I, when we lose sight of everything else, when we're in that much pain, this is a time in life when our perspective can easily sideline you. It can, it can sideline you and paralyze you to see what God actually wants us to see. And God is showing Jonah this exact thing. Look again at the conversation uh, with Jonah. But God comes back and he says, you've been concerned about this plant, but you didn't tend it. You didn't make it grow. It sprang up overnight. Should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left hand, and also many animals? God asks Jonah, he says, is it right for you to be angry about this plant withering and dying? And in a quick second, God says, you had nothing to do with it. You didn't cause it to grow. You didn't, you didn't water it. You didn't trim it. You didn't do nothing to make that plant happen. And then when it's gone, you're ticked off about it. How is that, how is that right? When it stops benefiting your comfort, you get angry. See, the real question is, what right do you have to be angry, Jonah? You did nothing to deserve it. You did nothing to foster it, to care it, to maintain it. Grace is something undeserved. See, God is showing Jonah. Grace is that thing that is undeserved, and it goes to the undeserving. It's extended to those who just, quite frankly, they shouldn't receive it. Why does it matter to you, Jonah? What happens to somebody that I extend grace to? What does it cost you? Why does it matter 
that they've received God's grace in their time of crisis. After all, don't forget who this is, right? This is Jonah, the very same Jonah who ran away from God, who went in the opposite direction from God. And what did God do? Showed him grace. God showed him grace. And yet, He can't possibly see that somebody else should receive grace. God gave him a second chance, and yet somebody else receives a second chance, and he's like, how dare you? What? You had nothing to do with it. Jonah's perspective has blinded him to seeing what God was doing in the world around him. And we find Jonah kind of perched on a hillside, looking over, and he's asking this one question. Why them? God, why them? See, this is what happens when you and I lead out with judgment, we see everybody else and we're like, why them? Why is life going so well for them? Why her? Why is she getting married not me? Why, why this? Why that? Why is he getting a promotion? Why does their family look better than mine? Why do they have a, a happier marriage? Why this? Why them? But see, when we see, when we flip our perspective... We actually really should be asking the question, why me? Jonah should have been sitting on the hillside saying, why me? Why did God show me grace? I didn't deserve it. There's nothing that I did. That means I should have gotten grace. See, every way of seeing is is a way of not seeing. When When you see life through the eyes of judgment, you are putting yourself in a position that celebrates punishment. But when you look through the eyes of grace, it causes you to celebrate forgiveness. It causes you to celebrate stories of forgiveness. But while Jonah is waiting for the city to be punished, he missed out on God's act of forgiveness. His vision needed correction. And it leads us to our last point in the book of Jonah, that judgment is blinding. When you and I live in a, in a season of judgment, we're blind We are blind to the ways of God. We just can't see things. We miss out on God's forgiveness, God's grace. We miss out on the stories of redemption and restoration. We miss out on, on seeing lives be put back together, lives transformed by the grace of God. You miss out on that. But there is not one follower of Jesus in this room, not a single person in this entire room, who can describe their story, their faith journey, without using these two words, forgiveness and grace. You can't do it. And yet sometimes, as Christians, we act a lot like Jonah. We sit in judgment rather than in grace. Listen, if you're new to church, I I just want to, I want to have a conversation with us churchy folks, okay? Like I want to, I want to talk about um, who we are as a church, in fact. And so if you're new to church, just maybe allow me this family conversation. In fact, what I'm about to say, you may be more qualified to say than I am because I've been inside the church for so long. But why is it, church people, church folks, why is it that Christ followers act like they've always been Christ followers and they judge other people that aren't currently following Christ? Why do we forget the grace that God has shown us and neglect to show that very same grace to other people? Like, what gives with that? I I just don't understand it. Guys, because of God's grace, the church, this church is a place where both sinner and saint Runners and former runners are welcome. These chairs, this room, who should be filling these chairs? Human beings. Every single person. Like the entire world. There is not one person who should, it would be not allowed to sit in these chairs. But the problem comes in is when somebody you know, you know their past, you know their baggage, you know their history, they start walking towards from the parking lot towards the front doors. We kind of go like this, oh my gosh, what are they doing here? Like hell truly must have frozen over for them to come to church. Like what gives with that, right? This is the safest place for people to come. This is a place where people shouldn't be judged. This is a place where people shouldn't be like, you know, ostracized or put on the outside because of something that they're not currently doing. Guys, God is the God of second chances. God is the God of grace and forgiveness. God is the one who takes the the things that we shouldn't have been done and lovingly coaches us and guides us along. That's the job of the Holy Spirit, to help us become more like his son, like Jesus. 
And yet the church too often stiff arms the rest of the world and says, until you get it together, you can't be here. Guys, Hope City is a place where we have, from the very beginning, has said that grace wins. Not at the expense of truth. Because, man, the Bible is filled with truth. And if you're new to church, I I want you to know that I'm not trying to hide this. I'm not trying to sugarcoat it. We are all about Jesus here. We believe that following Jesus makes you better at life and makes your life better. I believe that. I also think that following Jesus means that you and I probably should stop doing a a whole bunch of stuff and start doing a whole bunch of other things. And we're going to talk about that, you know, every single week here at Hope City. But don't for a single second feel like, well, I'm not cleaned up enough, or I don't believe like they believe, or I don't behave like they believe, so I can't come to church. Wrong. We want you here. We think this is the best place for you to be. But understand, we also think that because we believe that that God is willing to take any person. Look at me. I mean, he took my life, changed my life. He He can do so much in yours. But church, let's not forget where we've come from. See, I don't know about you guys, but I actually strangely want to be like Jonah. Because one day when I'm old and I have less hair than I do right now, I want to go out on the the hillside of Sarasota, which means I'll be sitting on celery fields. And I want to look out over our city. And I want to think to myself, man, I got to witness God do some incredible things here. Like through God's grace, I got to see him change lives. I got to see families put back together. I got to see marriages restored. I got to see addictions kicked. I got to see children return to parents. I got to see so many amazing things because of what God has done. And sometime years down the road, be like, I can't believe that God allowed me to be a part of that. Guys, can you imagine what it would be like if you saw the world with your eyes but God's perspective? If you saw clearly, what could that be like? Like, what could it be like if you went into your your workplace tomorrow and instead of sitting in a seat of judgment, you let out from a position of grace? Imagine what God could do in your life, in your relationships with your friends. How deep could those relationships be if they were grace-based relationships? Parents, I want you to think about your kids. What could it be like if we parented our children from a place of of grace and we taught them what it meant to be a gracious person? I'm convinced that it could change your life. In fact, some of you in this room, you need to just change the way that you see. Maybe you need a pair of glasses. Maybe they need to be spiritual lenses put in your, your existing frames but you need to change the way that you see life. Some of you are just bitter. And you need to let bitterness go. You need to let God heal you from that bitterness. Others of you are holding on to shame and regret. And God said, give that to me. You don't need to carry that any longer. And God God can heal you from your pain too. From the pain of your past, from the pain of relationships, from the pain of, man, you name it, God can heal you from that. Crush dreams. But some of you right now, you're just afraid of what God's been asking you to do. You feel like Jonah in a way where you're like, God, please don't ask me to go there. Anything but that. But what if you saw it differently? This morning, I'm convinced that some of us just need to change the way that we see. See, God is not against you. God is actually for you. God loves you. And I can't think of a better way to end this entire series than to end this series with communion, a time of communion. Because communion is really all about changing the way we see things. Communion is coming to this this table right here and right here, grabbing a, a, a wafer, a cracker, dipping it into the juice right there, And remembering what Jesus has done for us. See, communion changes our perspective. It makes things a little bit clearer. It puts life into perspective. It reminds us that there is no place that you can run, no place that you can go, where you're you're far from God. Because Jesus died on the cross. And right before that, he hung out with his friends and he said the most incredible thing. He said, this is my body which has been broken for you. Took bread and passed it around. 
And he said, this is my blood which has been poured out for you, the blood of the new covenant. Drink this. And anytime you do it, remember me. Remember what I've done for you. And so guys, today, let this time of communion change the way that you see. Let this time be a time where you actually reflect and think about all that God has done for you and wants to do in you and through you. Guys, I'm convinced that what he's doing here in our city, what he's doing here in our church, what he's doing in your life and in your family, this is just the beginning. That God wants to do more than you can even imagine. But it oftentimes requires us to see differently. God, I thank you for the ways that you have, have loved us and forgiven us. God, I thank you for your grace. And Lord, I pray that today, as we take communion, God, would you help us to see differently? Help us to see the world through your eyes, through your lenses. God, may we go as, as men and women, as, as teenagers, as, as boys and girls, as we leave this place. God, may we go into the world loving people the way that you do, seeing people the way that you do. God, flip our perspective. Change our sight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.